Good. I like that. It feels like you're like in a game and they're playing a song before the game to get you like hyped up. That's how it feels like when they play the worship music. Uh, so I wanted to ask you guys, who here is attracted to people who are like boring and dry and soulless and micromanagers and making rules all the time? Who's attracted to those type of people? Raise your hands. Nobody, right? Oh, one person. All right. So, no, we usually are attracted to people who are passionate and have a seal for things and, and have a reckless love, and that one song says, towards the things that they do. And that's why I like David, because David is one of those people. David wasn't a rule maker. He actually broke rules. He killed a giant as a child. He danced naked. And he ate the holy bread he really wasn't supposed to be eating. So in Matthew 12, 1 through 8, we read about that. And it says, at the time Jesus passed through the grain fields on the Sabbath day, his disciples were hungry and began to pick and eat some heads of grain. When the Pharisees said, saw this, the rule makers, they said to him, see, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. And Jesus said to them, haven't you read what David did when he and those who were with him were hungry? How he entered the house of God and they ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for him or for those with him to eat, but only for the priest? Or haven't you read in the law that on the Sabbath day the priests in the temple violate the Sabbath and are innocent? I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. If you had known what this means, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. You would not have condemned the innocent, for the Son of Man is the Lord of this Sabbath. And that reminds me, for example, how when my daughter, who is now driving, she has a seal for driving, she likes to drive, and I impose rules upon her. I say, don't go 55, go 50. Don't go 70, go 60. And I kill her seal. I kill her passion for driving by imposing extra rules that are not there. Those are my rules, those are not the rules. And I kill that passion. And I think like David, we need to be like David, not kill people's passion, but have passion, have seal, have a heart after God, because that is what draws people to Christ, that seal and that passion. So when we pray. Lord, I just pray that we may be like David. Have a man, be a man, be men and women who love you, who have a seal of passion for you who have a heart after God. And I pray that the Great Cross and Baptist Church and the Harrington's who are in France right now serving you may have that same seal, that same passion as David, so that we may, so that people may want that too and seek and follow you because of that. So in the holy name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. One we greet one another.
speak through his perfect and inerrant word from 1 Samuel chapter 21 starting in verse 1. David went to the priest Ahimelech at Nob. Ahimelech was afraid to meet David so he said to him, why are you alone and no one is with you? David answered the priest Ahimelech, the king gave me a mission but he told me don't let anyone know anything about the mission I'm sending you on or what, I'll have, what I've ordered you to do. I have stationed my young men at a certain place. Now, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever can be found. The priest told him, there is no ordinary bread on hand. However, there is consecrated bread. But the young men may eat it only if they have kept themselves from women. David answered him, I swear that women are being kept from us, as always when I go out to battle. The young men's bodies are consecrated even on an ordinary mission, so of course their bodies are consecrated today. So the priest gave him the consecrated bread, for there was no bread, there was no bread there except the bread of the presence that had been removed from the presence of the Lord. When the bread was removed, it had been replaced with warm bread. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you today and we hope that we are beholding you and praising you through your word, through prayer, through the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray for boldness, clarity with the gospel and with Pastor Andy this morning as he brings our message. Lord, help us all to have hearts ready to receive your word, transform our lives. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen. It's good to uh, be here together worshiping uh, this morning as we have been reflecting already, as we've been singing about what it means to really behold our God. And that's my prayer as we um, read and study his word, that we would behold God in his word. And that's why he gives us his word is so that we would come to know God, we would come to see God, and understand who God is in, in deeper and more meaningful ways as we really dive in, as we read and learn and grow, and, and the way he's revealed himself to us. And so uh, when we talk about beholding our God, we behold our God through singing, but ultimately we behold our God through the truths that he has revealed to us, right? We behold our God through the truths that we sing, that we know about and read about in his word, and what he's taught us and shown us. And so that's my prayer as we continue through the book of 1 Samuel today that we've been going through, that we would behold God in, in a new way, in a fresh way, and that you would see God in him working through David's life. And so with that in mind, let me ask you, have you ever had a time in your life, and, and maybe that time is now, where you are, are just kind of really wrestling with whether or not God would provide? It could be a health problem. It could be a church you're looking for. It could be... Um, uh, a spouse that you're trying to find or look look and, and get married one day. It could be all kinds of things. A job. Uh, but we, I think we all have moments throughout our lives where we wonder, is God going to provide? Uh, where is God in this? Right? Where is he? Now, it, this happened one, one time in my life that really kind of stands out. It was about four and a half years ago. Before I came here to Safe Harbor, we had been uh, serving at a, a church a plant. It was kind of, we were trying to start a new campus of a church in Lexington. And after we got in, into it for a while, it, it just became evident it was not going to work out. And the problem was, at that point, I'd already left my engineering job. Uh, I'd been in seminary, uh, and I was getting paid kind of uh, on a year 
long basis by a mission board uh, to serve as the campus pastor of this church. And so that was about to run out. And with it, my income was about to run out. And, uh, and so I'm like, uh, they and I made the decision we needed to transition out of this. And then, and then at that point, we didn't know what was going to happen, right? Uh, how are we going to make money? Are we going to have a job? Do I need to go back to engineering? I'm still in school and seminary at that point. And so we're like, okay, God, did we move, moved to Georgetown. We left Lexington. We left engineering. Did we hear you wrong? Uh, what's going on? And uh, by his grace and through his providence, the Lord led us here to Safe Harbor and really uh, in just a few months. And, uh, man, it's been such a blessing uh, to, for, to see God uh, work and bring us here. And then what he's done in the time that we've been here, uh, it truly does show that God's plan is bigger than we can ever think of or imagine, but also how God provides. Right? God provides even when we don't know how it's going to happen. And so today we get to a point in David's life where he is asking that same question. He's at a critical time in his life. His whole life at this point is uncertain. He doesn't know what he's going to do from one day to the next. Uh, and because up to this point, if you were here last week, we saw that, that King Saul had become jealous of David and his fame and his success. And David's now more popular than the king. And so King Saul has tried at eight times to try to kill David now. And so David's just running for his life, trying to find somewhere where he can be safe. And, uh, and he's running. And so the question in David's mind at this point is, God, are you going to provide for me? I, I mean, you anointed me to be the next king. It doesn't look like that's happening. God, are you going to provide? Are you going to come through in this time of need, in this time of desperation? And so what we're going to see is kind of a big truth in all this that in David's life, and, and I hope we'll see it in our life, and that is, look, when we are tempted to, to doubt God, to drift from God, wondering where he is, and, and tempted to kind of look at other places away from God, you can rest in the truth. You can rest in the assurance that God will provide, that he will provide in ways that you could never predict. And all of us know this. So we've experienced it in the past, but we forget it so quickly. We forget it so quickly, and we start to turn to things that we know we shouldn't turn to, and we forget about God, and we start looking in other places because our memories are short, and we forget how gracious God is. And so we need to be reminded today, again, that God will provide for us even now, even now. All right, so let's look at David's life in, in 1 Samuel 21, 22. We're going to work, work through this and see David's kind of some, some things that he goes through and how God proves over and over again he, he will provide. He will provide for David. And he will provide for you. So the first thing I want us to, to see and to come to grips with is the ways that we are tempted to doubt God. Right? We, we need to realize sometimes we are maybe drifting or doubting God in our minds and we don't even realize it. All right, And so that's what I want us to think about. If any man in this world ever had a reason to doubt God, it was David. I mean, David was supposed to be God's man. right? The, the one who would lead God's people. And now he's running for his life. What happened? So we see, first of all, the story starts out and David is already on the run, as we saw last week. We left off. David has left Jonathan. Jonathan's told him to go peace, go in peace somehow uh, with all this going on. And so David is running for his life. Can God save his life? That, that mind or that thought is creeping in David's mind. And we pick up in verse 1 of 1 Samuel 21. It says this. David went to the priest Ahimelech at Nob. Nob was a city where priests lived in Israel. Ahimelech was afraid to meet David. So he said to him, why are you alone and no one is with you? At this point, you know that people know that, that Saul is trying to kill David. He sent all his people, all his servants. And so Ahimelech sees David. He's like, uh-oh, I, I don't want anything to do with this guy. right? And so he asked David, look, why are you alone? Why is no one with you? And then we see in verse 2, as Pastor Chad just read, David makes up a story. So he, he tells Ahimelech that Saul has sent him on a secret mission. Uh, false. That is not true. He's making up a story to save his own skin. And, uh, and so he's basically lying to him to, to preserve his life. And there's some debate of whether or not David was actually acting out in sin by, by lying to this priest. And some people say, no, he's not because he was just trying to save his life and he was trying to protect the innocence of Ahimelech. And other people say, well, it's never right to lie, right? <laughs> Ten Commandments, do not lie, right? Do we really trust God or are we going to lie? 
to try to preserve ourselves. And so, now there's some debate there, but the point is, look, David was so fearful, he had to make up a lie to save his life from a priest. He had to lie to a priest. All right? And the guy who goes to God himself, this priest could have prayed for David if he had known what was going on. But he didn't, and so he couldn't pray. And so we see that, that David's running for his life. That's the first way he, he could easily doubt and drift from God. Secondly, David is hungry, right? When I'm hungry, I get hangry, right? And we get, we get, when we get hungry, things just don't go, go well with us. And so he is hungry. He needs basic provision just to survive. Look at verse 3. He, he asked the priest after making up that story, Now what do you have on hand? What food do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever can be found. I'll eat anything. Right? And so the priest at this point gives David, he, he says, Look, I don't have regular food, regular bread. I'm going to give David some consecrated bread that, that's been in the temple and it's been pulled out and been replaced. So only there's certain restrictions that the people who could eat this, only people who made themselves clean and had not defiled themselves in any way. So God had kind of put these fences around who could eat this bread. And so the priest gives them that bread and then he gives them Goliath's sword uh, for protection. So we see he's hungry, right? He has that doubt. Is, that, is God going to give me food to eat? Is he going to provide for my basic, most foundational needs? And then, he, and then he's also desperate uh, to get away from his enemies. He's so desperate that, that he actually goes to more enemies, right? Saul's chasing him, and look where he goes in verse 10 of, of uh, 1 Samuel 21. David fled that day from Saul's presence, from the priest, and went to King Achish of Gath. All right. Does anybody know this name, this town, Gath? You, it, it, we've actually talked about it before now in 1 Samuel, and that is actually the hometown of Goliath. All right, so that makes a lot of sense, right? Where, hey, I'm going to leave the priest of God and go to Goliath's hometown where I've already killed 10,000 of Philistines. There's actually a song about me killing 10,000 of these people. I'm going to them, and I've, I've got Goliath's sword with me. Like, that's a big sword. People would recognize it. And, and so this is how desperate David is. And but Achish's servants, that when David comes, Achish's servants said to him, Isn't this David, the king of the land? Don't they sing about him during their dances? Saul has killed his thousands, but David his tens of thousands of us, of us. And David took this to heart. He hears about this, and he became very afraid of King Achish of Gath. Makes sense. I would become afraid too, right? And he, he's been exposed. And David has to pretend, at this point, to be insane so they won't kill him. And so Achish, the king, finally says, look, I don't want insane people in my city. Send them out of here. Right? And so David leaves. In chapter 22, he goes to a cave and hides in a cave. That's where we leave off at the end of chapter 21, beginning of, 20, beginning of 22. Literally hiding in a cave. It doesn't get much worse than that. So we see, just to summarize here, David had every reason to doubt God, right? To, to be desperate, to drift from God, to look in other places, and he did at times. His life could be taken at any moment. He's hungry. He can't settle in anywhere. Like, do you know how hard it is to, to not know where you, if you can sleep at night and be safe? It's always on your mind. It weighs on you. And then to add on to it, there's no sign of this ending. There, there's no hope that this is going to end sometime soon. There's no clear direction from God on, on what action to take. Nowhere in that chapter does, does God say, hey, you need to go here, you need to go here, you need to talk to this person. We don't see that partly because David is acting out of fear and not out of faith. But he hadn't miraculously heard from God. There's a deep sense of aloneness and isolation in what he is facing. And so, and all these things, hey, look, we can relate to some of these things, right? Hey, nobody knows what I'm going through. Nobody knows how... Um, even my basic needs are a struggle right now. And God hasn't shown me what I need to do with this, with this challenge in my life. We, we can relate to these doubts and these things that David experienced. But what, what is true here is, look, David is in the thick of this uh, tendency or this, um, this temptation to doubt God and run from God and look in other places where he can find help. And the decisions he's making, acting insane, going to his enemies, lying to a priest, it shows that, hey, look, fear 
is driving him instead of his faith. I mean, he, he is at a critical juncture here. He needs somebody to show him that God would provide. He needs that. And for David, these overwhelming circumstances were a real threat to his faith, to his kingdom, to him serving God, to all the good things that would come later. It is at a, at a moment, a critical moment of, of fear and faith right here. And what in your life today may be doing that with you? What may be causing you to, maybe you felt yourself kind of drifting from God little by little. Something has creeped in. You're, you're doubting if God can really uh, meet that need or if God's going to be faithful to you or if he's going to provide for you and how good he really is. All right, something is creeping in and you're drifting. And sometimes those things are big and clear. Like for David, it was pretty clear what was happening. But for sometimes it's just, hey, like uh, I'm not sure that God's really loving me because this isn't turning out the way I thought it would. Even though it's not that big of a thing, my life is not really turning out the way I expected it to turn out. Something's going on. Where's God in this, right? And those little doubts can be, become huge. They can become huge. When something in our life is not right, Satan wants to, to take that and just explode it so that it becomes overwhelming to us, right? Because it, it makes us further and further doubt God and his goodness to us, and we think things are all messed up, and, and it's beyond God. And so just be aware. Look, little things can become big things when we start letting fear drive us instead of faith. And so is there some area today in your life where maybe you're doubting God? Maybe you're doubting that he can really provide what you think you need. And we see from David's life, hey, that is a reality that we all face. But we also realize that God doesn't leave us there. He brings us to that point to show us something bigger. And that is that he does provide. And we can rest in that. And we can take that to bank as we look to him, as we know him, as we pursue Jesus, that he will provide. You know, in the Bible, ongoing doubt is synonymous with unbelief. Doubt is synonymous with not really believing in God, not really knowing who God is, not really trusting in him. And so here we find that God has an answer for David's doubt that that puts it to an end. As, as Pastor John just read from Psalms, did you hear that prayer that David prayed in Psalms where he, he says, let us exalt God? That was while he was acting insane. God, that was God's answer to his fear. That we can exalt God because we know he provides. He provides. And so we see that as we continue on through chapter 22. All right, We can combat, combat doubt. <laughs> By reminding ourselves of God's unfailing provision. When you have seeds of doubt, go back. Remind yourself of how God has provided in the past and how he has promised to always provide for you. And we see that in David's life. That's how we live by faith. Look at in, in verses 3 and 4 of, of uh, 1 Samuel 20, 22. All right? Or 21, actually. David flees to the priest of Nob. Right? He's desperate. So desperate he has to lie. But look at what God does in verse 3. He asks the priest, now what do you have on hand? The priest gives him five loaves, uh, uh, or gives him uh, not ordinary bread, but the consecrated bread. And he says, look, only young men can eat it if they have kept themselves from women. And, and in that case, you know, they've not defiled themselves. They, they're pure before God in his law. Right? Only certain people that were pure before God could eat this bread. Or it would be simple. It would be atrocious to a, a holy God. And so in the midst of danger and hunger... David gets bread from a priest of God, and not just any bread. It's the bread of the presence, consecrated bread. This bread of the presence goes all the way back to the book of Leviticus, right? When God is giving his laws to his people about how they were to be holy and set apart from him and to live in such a way that, that they honored him and nothing would come between him, them and God if they lived this way, like the bread of the presence were 12 loaves of bread that represented the 12 tribes of Israel. And they were always to be in uh, the, the tabernacle in God's presence because it was a reminder to Israel of God's covenant with them. And how God had always promised to provide for them, for his people, that he was faithful to his people. All right? That's what the, this bread represented. And so here David, he knows that. And David is eating this bread that God had 
predetermined to represent his faithfulness to his people that God would provide. Is there any greater witness that David could have seen in that moment? No, no other food could have told him that, hey, God will provide and reminded him of that. That God has promised to his people to be faithful, that he wouldn't leave us. And that's what this bread is. It's not an accident. God is directly speaking to David's faith in this moment of weakness, this moment of hunger. David, I will provide for you. And here's the bread in my presence to prove it. I made this promise hundreds of years ago to my people, and it still remains true to you. My promise never fades. It is always faithful. And God says that to us today. Look, when we eat any food, it is a reminder that God is faithful to provide. And as little as that seems, we, we take it for granted a lot of times, right? It is God providing the fact that we would have a bite to eat after our worship service today. But God provides a lot more than physical food. He has, he has given us much, much more than just physical food. He provides food for your soul. Like those deepest longings in you, those deepest desires that, that your life would count, that you would matter, and that you would know God and know that you're not alone and know that your life's going to be provided for. And God provides that in your soul through Jesus. In Matthew 12, verse 4, as, we, as Pastor Carlos read at the beginning of the service, we read that verse, and Jesus is reflecting on how David read, uh, ate the consecrated bread right here in, in 1 Samuel. And Jesus brings that up for a reason. Because he's pointing Israel to the law. God had given them this law not to restrict it. Like some would say, well, why, why wouldn't God just let them eat this bread? Right? This, the, the law, which reserved that bread only for people who were holy and set apart for him, was meant to show the people that they needed God's provision. Like they, there was a holy God that they couldn't approach in just some flippant way. That they were separated from God. They needed his, his provision for food for their soul. Like they were hungry without God. They needed God. And, and he had to, to determine the way they could get God. And so this is exactly what Jesus has done for us. He has fulfilled that longing in our soul. He's shown that God provides what we need. Just as the bread was meant to provide for David and, sh and point David to his need for God, Jesus reminds us of our need for God. That we need God's forgiveness of our sin, but he provides for that need on the cross. Jesus meets the needs you have in your soul. Only he can satisfy it. And we see that in, in John 6, where Jesus calls himself the bread of life. We see this image of the bread again, right? The fact that Jesus is telling them, look, I give you life. Like when you feel dead in some way, when you feel a need of provision, I give you life. Because I am the bread of life, I satisfy the deepest spiritual longings in your souls. Your spiritual longings is for God, and in Jesus you will not hunger. And so when you face pressures, when you face doubts and drift from God, and tendency to drift from God, you will be satisfied as you seek Jesus and live in his presence. That is what you need in those moments. Live in his presence and find Satisfaction. And so we see that God provides uh, deliverance from our hunger, right? God also provides deliverance from our enemies, as we see here in David's life. So in verses 10 through 15, as I mentioned, David goes to Gath, right? The, the hometown of Goliath. And he's the enemy of Israel. The Philistines are the Israel, uh, enemies of Israel. He's carrying Goliath's sword. He's entering a city where he has literally created widows because he's killed their husbands in battle. Knowledge of David is widespread. It's everywhere. They know who this guy is. He's enemy number one. If you got the FBI's top ten list, he's number one. Right? They're trying to find him. So David had to be desperate to attempt this. He had to be. He was, but he was willing to take the risk of being recognized by his enemies rather than being captured by King Saul. Talk about being in a hard place. Right? He needs deliverance from his enemies in the worst way. And one commentator put it like this. Look, when King Achish of, of Gath is your best hope, you're in real trouble, right? When this guy, when that, the enemy king is your best hope, you're in real trouble. So verse 13, we pick up. And so, so he, David, sees that, that the Philistines recognize him. And he pretended to be insane in their presence. He acted like a madman around them, scribbling on the doors of the city gate and letting saliva run down his beard. 
Look, you can see this man is crazy. Achish said to his servants, Why did you bring him to me? Do I have such a shortage of crazy people that you brought this one to act crazy around me? Is this one going to come into my house? Like, get this guy away from me. I don't want to have him around me. He's, he's crazy. Nobody likes to hang out with people that have slide, slide just dripping down their beards, right? I mean, that's gross. Right? Nobody wants that. Who wants to hang around with that kind of person? And so even though David acts insane to preserve his life, make no mistake, it is God who is saving his life here. There is no reason why David should have gotten out of that city and not been killed. I mean, they wanted to kill this guy. And, and the fact that he's insane, that would make me want to just get rid of him even more. Let's just be done with him, right? Let's get rid of him. And so this is God's care and providence that is sparing David's life from his worst enemies. God is there, even though we, we don't explicitly see it here. And this, remi this is a reminder to us that even in our mistakes, even in our foolishness, like that was foolish for David to do that, right? Even in our mistakes and our foolishness, the things that we mess up more than we could ever imagine, the things that bring us shame and guilt and fear, God can still deliver us from our enemies, those enemies that we face, those things that bring us down and threaten us. And so God deserves praise for those things because he provides deliverance when we don't deserve it. Matthew 6, 13, the Lord's Prayer, Jesus prays this line. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us from our enemies. Deliver us from evil. And here is how Jesus does that. He delivers us just like he delivered David and his enemies. He, he delivers us from our greatest enemy. Right? The sin that threatens to entangle us and destroy us. God delivers us from that. He delivers us from the consequences of past sins so that we don't stay in it. He delivers us from uh, our current sin and temptation that we're struggling with right now. He brings us through that. And he delivers us from any temptation we may face in the future. Jesus is the one who delivers us from evil. Right now, your greatest enemy, your greatest threat is not a person. It's not an unmet desire in your life. It's not a need that you think you have. That's not your greatest enemy. It's not what somebody has said about you or how your job is a mess or whatever else. That is not your greatest enemy. Your greatest enemy is the temptation of sin that would cause you to doubt God and to live your life with him. Because God is sufficient for all those other things. God can get you through all those other things and actually bring you joy and goodness in those things. Your greatest enemy is anything that would rip you from God in them. And Jesus overcomes that. He provides deliverance from those things that, that separate us from God. So we simply must be like David and remember our weakness, see our weakness, and how Jesus offers to provide for us and meet us in those places. Through his death, right? Through his death on a cross, he met our deepest need, our deepest weakness, our deepest... He took our, our biggest enemy head on and crushed his head. He crushed his head. We have victory with Christ. But without Christ, we have no victory. So are you walking with him in those things you're facing? Those enemies from people, what they're saying, what they're doing to you? Is it Jesus bringing you deliverance from those things, or are you fighting that battle on your own? You're going to lose. You're going to lose. Walk in his presence and find deliverance. All right. The third thing we see is that God provides through the work of others, through how he has worked in the lives of other people. For a while, in, in chapter 22, we see David goes and hides in this cave of Adullam. All right? And then we read this in verses 3 through 4. From there, David went to Mizpah of Moab, where he said to the king of Moab, let, Please let my father and my mother stay with you until I know what God will do for me. He's trying to find protection for his family. Right? His family is in real danger. If he's, the king's trying to kill him, he's probably going to try to kill his family too. So he left them in the care of the king of Moab, and they stayed with him the whole time David was in the stronghold, in, in the cave. Look, what is significant about this? Well, well, Moab may not mean a lot to you, 
But it was an important place in the Bible because that was where Ruth was from. And Ruth just so happened to be David's great-grandmother. Right? And so that, that was her hometown. That was her home country. People knew her. They loved her. And so here comes her great-grandson needing help. In the book of Ruth, if you have read that book in the Bible, it's about a, a woman, Naomi, who is an Israelite who has left to try to find food. And she's in desperate times. She's, she's hungry. There's a famine. Her husband's her husband and her sons die. And so her and Ruth have to go back to Israel. They're widows. They don't have any way to provide for themselves. God faithfully provides and meets their need. Ruth eventually marries Boaz. And through their children, along comes David. And so we see here a big picture of what God is doing. God is using Naomi's suffering hundreds of years before. God is using Ruth's faithfulness to, to honor Naomi and honor the Lord hundreds of years before to save David's family hundreds of years later. Actually, probably about 100 years later. Right? So God is working all this thing. God is working through other people even before this time to save his people, to preserve their lives. And God, we see here a truth that God plans his kindness to us long beforehand. We don't have to doubt that. The fact that you are here today, if you know Christ today, God planned that long beforehand and worked those circumstances so that you would see him, so that you would know him and love him and follow Jesus. Like, that is God's kindness to you. Like, God would do that for you is a huge grace. Just like him saving David's family is a huge grace to David. That he could go to these people and find safety. People that normally would have hated him. But because of his family, because of God's work in his family, there's safety there. This is evidence of how God works. And God provides through the work of others. Maybe even people we haven't even met. And God can work all things for our good as we love him, as we know him. Even to bring us to know him. And so this also reminds us that God can use us today. As messed up as our lives seem, are seen to us, God can still use you. Right? God could use a Naomi and Ruth, two lowly, messed up women who didn't have a whole lot of lo uh, hope in life at that point. But they kept trusting God. Right? They kept being faithful to him. And God used them in, in their great-grandson's life. And we see the same pattern in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians uh, 1, verses 26 through 26. 27, Paul says this, not many of you were wise by human standards, not many of you were influential, and many of you were, and not many of you were of noble birth, but God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of this world to shame the strong. And so how many of us in this room think, hey, I'm pretty influential, right? I'm pretty wise. I'm, I'm a sharp guy. <laughs> or I'm, I'm pretty noble, right? I, I'm I've got nobility in my family. I'm going to be like this great, well-known celebrity, right? No. But that doesn't matter. According to God's economy, he can use anybody. He can use a Ruth. He can use a Naomi, and he can use a you, right? And that should encourage you. Like, let's be used by God. Like, I want God to use me in people's lives and in this world. I want him to use me like he used Ruth to save people hundreds of years after me because I was faithful now, Right? And so that is what he's calling us to do. Be faithful now and know that God can use you and he can use others in your life as you follow him. And so we see, look, God provides in that way. And then last we see, look, God provides through his word. God provides through his word. After David secures this safety for his family in Moab, God gives him a special word through a unique prophet. So first of all, before we even get to that, David is anticipating that God would do something. Look at verse 3. From there, David, when he goes to Mizpah of Moab, he says to the king of Moab, Please let my father and mother stay with you until I know what God will do for me. Do you, do you hear that last line? He believes God is going to do something. So today, if you feel like you're in a bad place, if you feel like you're despairing in some way or you're hurting or desperate in some way, look at that line and know that God is going to do something for you as you Seek Christ as you follow Jesus. Like God is acting in this world. He's not silent. He is acting. And then we see for David, he, he experiences that. God speaks to him. Verse 5. Then the prophet Gad said to David, Don't stay in the stronghold. 
leave and return to the land of Judah. And so David left and went to the forest of Horeb. God sends a prophet to speak direct words to David to tell him where to go. All right? So now he knows the next step that was missing before. He knows what he needs to do to find safety and to follow God's plan. What we see here is David is experiencing a spiritual revival in spite of all these severe tests he is facing, facing right, to his faith. He is seeking God's will. He's telling the Moabites, look, I'm trusting God. I believe he's going to speak. That's what we see in these psalms, three psalms he's written, right? He's longing for God to speak. He's asking God to speak. He's believing that God would speak. And he's praising God in the midst of those things, as hard as they are. And the result of this is, look, David has this renewed uh, life with God, right? He has a renewed attentiveness and prayer to God. He's seeking God diligently because he believes it. And then his faith is strengthened as he sees it happen. He's aware that God is doing this, that God's sending the prophet. God's giving him a word. And we see that in, in Psalm 57, verse 3. During this time, he, he's talking to the Moabites. It says this, he, God, will send from heaven and save me. He will. Uh, he's not doing it now, but he will. He will put to shame him who tramples on me. God will send out his steadfast love and his faithfulness. All right, that's what David is believing. God will save him. And God answers it. God sends his prophet with his word. David was hunted and desperate, and God was not silent to him. And friends, that is the same for us. We know already that God has saved us. The salvation that David looked for and longed for, we can look back and see. And so we don't have to live wondering if God is going to provide. He's already provided. He's already proven it. He's proven his faithfulness to us. And God is still not silent to us today. God speaks to us in our most de desperate times from his word. He speaks to us. Look at Hebrews 12. Therefore, since we have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, we've seen God's faithfulness. Let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith. Keeping our eyes on Jesus. Keeping our eyes on Jesus. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. And sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He did that for us. Keep your eyes on him. And how do you keep your eyes on Jesus? Through his word. Right? His word shows us who he is. It shows us what he's done. It shows us what he, he's doing for us right now. It's where he reveals his, himself to us. Every aspect of himself. His power. His faithfulness. His mercy. His grace. His love. His forgiveness. All those things. We see those in his word. We look on Jesus in his word. We see how he has provided for us what we really need. And he offers to give that to us again right now and what we need right now as we walk and know him. So we see David experiencing how God provides those things through his word. And then we see in chapter 22, it ends, Saul hears about all this stuff going on. He hears about how David has gone to this priest where David is, how he's on the run, and Saul just loses his mind even more. He get, basically goes on a witch hunt and tries to kill everybody who's had any contact with David. Right? So he kills the priest. Then he kills the priest's family, all the other male priests, except for one. One escapes. And then he goes to that whole city of Nob and kills everybody. Men, women, children, everybody. Like, that's King Saul. He's, he's desperate, right? And yet in the midst of all this desperation of Saul, we see on the other side of that, David's renewed faith while he's on the run. King Saul has it all. He has a kingdom. He has a palace. He has many wives. He has children. He has all these things. And he is desperate. And David has nothing, and he has renewed faith because God has provided for him. He's seen it. He knows it. And he can live wherever he is, whatever he's doing, with the faith that God is with him. And so for David, his faith came from seeing God's provision even in the wilderness of life and in the fears that he faced, David had a greater hope as he trusted in the Lord. And for you today, look, do you see God's provision for you? 
Do you see how he has provided in the past? And do you see how that gives you hope now? That God has not left you. He's still the same God. The same God that saved you however many years ago. The same God has provided in other ways. Like, he is there. Keep seeking him. Don't give up seeking him. David had to endure, right? He, he didn't give up when he could have. And he had struggles along the way. He didn't do it perfectly. But he kept seeking God. Romans 8.37, Jesus tells us, In Christ we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So what you're facing right now, you are more than conquerors through him who loved you, through Jesus and, and his presence in your life. So that means, look, nothing in all creation, nothing on this world, no hardship, no power, no bad experience, nothing, and this is how we're more than conquerors, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's how we get conquered. We conquer it because we know God's love. It doesn't mean that our situation always turns out great the way we think it should, but we know God's love in it, and so we conquer it. Right? God's love is enough for us. That's what we really need, so you have a choice. Do you live like you believe that? Do you live like you believe that you are more, more than a conqueror in what you're facing right now because of Jesus and his love for you and his presence in your life? Do you believe that? Do people look around you and say, man, that guy's more than a conqueror over these situations because he knows Jesus is walking with him in it. And in spite of what he's done to mess it up, he's still following Jesus and believing God can overcome that in his life. Have you reminded yourself of how God has already provided for you? I mean, think about your life over the past. How's God provided for you? Do you remember that? Do you think about it? Do you praise him for that? Do you dwell on what that reveals about his character and his presence in your life? Look, he has given Jesus for your sin. Jesus died for your sin. That is God's ultimate example of provision. If you follow him, you are forgiven. You don't have to wonder anymore. You don't have to hope you're good enough. Right? God has provided that once and for all in Jesus. He's given you life. He's given you a walk with him where you know God. And you can have a big view of him like David had because of Jesus and what he's done. And listen, never doubt that he will continue to provide for you. All right? Keep seeking him. Let's pray to him. God, we thank you for this picture of David's life where in spite of his own failures, in spite of his own faults, God, that you provided. You didn't have to. You saved his life from his enemies. You gave him food. You worked in ways before his life even existed to save him and his family. And you sent your word. And God, we acknowledge today that you provide for us Help us to long to know your provision. Help us to know it, God. To not live in doubt, to not live in fear, but to live a life that as things get tough, we look to you even more. Because we trust you and we know you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.